I was out there. Um, I, honestly, we got in uh, kind of late last night, and then we had issues with the the door code thing for the Airbnb, and that sucked. Oh man, stuck and then, yep, stuck outside for a hot minute. And then we had to get in through the garage and then uh, smoked a bunch of weed and went to bed because I thought we were going out and getting food, and that was not the case because everyone's like, we "Got to work in the morning," and I was like, "That fucking sucks." I'm gonna get real high so I can go sleepy time real good. And then I got woken up and it was like, hey, can you go get us groceries? Like, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you're like all bleary. You're like, come on. Oh, man. Could have used that last night. <laughs> so I think tonight, uh, today, as soon as I'm done with this, I think we're going to, I think the ladies, my wife and our friend are done with work. And then we're going to go explore. I think we're going to go to a dive bar and start our vacation. That's where it's at. Yeah, we were about to go to Nashville this past week i would have been there right now actually strangely but uh we postponed it because fucking omicron and whatnot but yeah i mean it looks like you're dressed for to be here more than i am right yeah it was pretty- <laughs> flare. yeah um i don't i wasn't told if you had anyone at a certain time or how long we had usually i go try to go about like 45 minutes to an hour is that good yeah whatever works man i'm just here so Fair enough. And uh, honestly, this is just more of a conversation than, than anything. So I'm not going to be like, so your last record was this. And then this one seems to be more, of this, you know, whatever. Like, so that's not fun. Yeah, this is probably uh, the first thing I've done for this new album cycle. Uh, so that's cool. Give me, can I, can I come back in like two minutes? I have to fix my mustache. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think that might be my new thing of why someone had to walk away for a minute. I seriously don't know how the dude from two minutes to midnight always holds his microphone like this. This is like really annoying. That these microphones weigh a lot. I'm just vamping for the audio for down the road in the video. I don't I don't even know if you can hear me. It doesn't matter. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. No, you're so, good. Quick yeah, just, just making a uh, comment about how I don't know how the dude from two minutes to midnight always holds this fucking thing like this. this these microphones are surprisingly heavy. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. But it's, like, you know, sings with it and moves around with it, and it's like not I know, it's like they need a little screw in pistol grip or something. Yeah, yeah I was looking at one of those those fun arm you know, I feel like I thought being like a shitty musician was bad enough because I, I spend all this money on gear that I'm never going to fucking use for the capabilities of what it should be used for. Like, do I need a, like a half stack? No. Cause I'm playing in a room like four feet away from it. Not that's, even that's, that's so the game though. Yeah. Right. It's like, Oh, you need this and this and this. And then it's like, well, fuck. Yeah. I, I hear you, man. I've got like this analog synth. I rarely use, <laughs> you know, it's like occasionally, but it's like, Sometimes it's just more of a headache, and I just want to, like, you know, just use a plug-in, whatever. Well, as I say, I saw, like, because you're not super active on social media from what I what I could find. Um, so but then it was funny, because I, I love that the, the most recent recent post of yours on Instagram was actually talking about a plug-in. And I was like, all right, well, I mean, he's using it for the right reasons, which is to uh, get a hookup on on things that allow you to, to do the band stuff. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Um. Something kind of, you know, the one thing I, I will kind of speak about uh, on the record, um, just because you said no one really has talked to you at all about it. Uh, I loved, spoiler alert, I love the Buddy Holiday melody in Fancy Wind that you threw in real fast. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so that's good. We're going we're going old school, uh, like with the old hardcore way of uh, throwing in movie sound clips and just being like, hey, if you, right. if you catch Whatever it, you catch happened it. to that, you know, I feel like that kind of ended around like, the early 2010s it's like all of a sudden no more samples and whatnot ever so do you well i mean i think you could almost look at pop culturally or just culturally not even pop that that's when everyone got super litigious like everyone realized that you can just i mean everyone's known that you can sue for the dumbest of fucking reasons but yeah i think label like i feel like that's around the time label and and the figureheads kind of realize like well we're not making money on selling record oh wait 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 there's a sample there we can yeah, get him, get him. Yeah. yeah, like uh, that song "Fancy Whim was actually written by uh, Marvin Gaye. So, yeah. so you're going all uh, 
Robin Thicke with it. You, you're just saying yeah, exactly. it was it was influenced by by them. Like you know, the family is coming after us and all that. So yeah. Well, I mean, it's so funny because like you, I you probably don't remember this, and I had a different name for the show back then too. But you know, you were on this show probably about a year and a half, two years into me starting it. We're just over five years now. Uh, you were in the first hundred, actually. I went back and looked. I think you were episode like ninety four, and we're right. at like this yeah, will probably right. be three forty or so. But it was just kind of funny thinking about how much has changed just in general. But even with your band, like I went back and kind of listened to it and felt like a dick kind of being like, so tell me more about, you know, this this John Goblicon thing, this character and, you know, the touring. And at the time, you know, it seemed like you were kind of figuring out what all it could be. And to kind of look back now and just see, you know, be, between the success of right now, there's a book uh, that John's got and, you know, just the uh i mean fuck post malone and joe rogan talked about your band like Prince, i mean yes, yes. i know you've posted about that uh the the clip itself but i mean kind of walk me through what that was like just kind of being like it was just like uh, right now i i just woke up one day and and everyone's texting me all excited like oh post malone post malone mess the band i'm like what the fuck are you talking about you know and i looked i'm like oh he mentioned necro that's pretty cool and yeah that just that alone definitely brought some traffic to our page and our YouTube and whatnot. Um, that was pretty cool. I was glad to hear the dude was a metal fan. And for some reason he, had, he heard Necro. I think, uh, I think our music video director, Brandon Dermer is mutual friends with someone that he's friends with. And that's how he heard about it. Um, but yeah, that was a, a great shout out and it was cool. And, uh, you know, hopefully a collab in the future. <laughs> and, and, uh, Given the diverse range of, both of your musical outputs, what do you envision a posty necro collab would sound like? That's the question, right? Like, would he be doing his, his sort of singing style on a necro metal thing? Or would it be like, oh, here's a pop song with some growls? I mean, I could see it going either way. Maybe we just have a goblin in the background in one of his videos. I mean, it could be anything. <laughs> I feel like that just needs to be a split, like a seven. I mean, talk about some things that don't exist anymore too. Right? Split. Yeah. Splits, like, man. It's like we're it's like, oh yeah, it's a Spotify split. It's like that's not cool. It's not the same. I I, I feel so old sometimes, like when talking about the shit like that, but it's like I was actually like just had pre-ordered a bunch of records that finally are getting in. And one of them happened to be an old uh, split that they usually do for record store day where they do those like covers oh, uh, sure. seven inches where it's like the original and then someone who covered it. Yeah. And it got me thinking, it's like, that seems like in the day and age now where everyone's too fickle to sit down and listen to a full album. It's like, why don't more bands kind of do that and kind of either yeah. branch off and do something with other bands and kind of expose their bands to another, a wider demo or whatever but yeah, like it's sort of like i mean you see it actually all the time in like in pop and edm genres it's always like so and so x so and so x so and so and then on spotify now and probably apple music too it, it just shows you like all of them under the artist category so i think that it's it's on all their pages or whatever. so i mean in a way they're doing that but it's it's not underground anymore now it's like a pop thing or something do you feel that maybe rock and or metal is too limiting to look at something like that, look at the success that hip hop and pop music is having and be able to work together to grow everything as a whole? I don't know. I I think there's a lot less of a big machine behind it and generally more grassroots or like, I mean, in our case, we're indie, but there, you know, we're not on a label. I feel like labels could be doing that. I, I'm not sure if it would be worth their while. I think, you know, it's like, oh, great. Now we got two bands no one's heard of doing a song together. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, it could, I feel like there's a lot more room to grow and people are still figuring stuff out. I mean, in the whole streaming is the thing nowadays world, it's kind of like still a bit wild westy. There's no standards in that sense. And it's also a lot harder. Like back in the day, if you got a split, you're like, well, I'm going to put the CD in and they're probably going to listen to the whole thing. Now you could just be like, eh, next, I'm going to click something else. I'm not going to say that's more ADD. I mean, if we could have done that back in the day, we probably would have just been skipping around too. So, well, I mean, a bit more ADD. Kind of going, I guess, speaking to the record as a whole, you know, I feel like I love 
listening to records as a whole. I, I kind of wish when I get these media links, like it came with like, you know, a PDF of like the liner notes and the lyrics. And all, so I kind of can talk more about that. But typically it's like, I just get the music and that's all I get. But it is something when I looked at your record, you know, the, uh, what is the technical term of uh, almost like a cross section of the goblin, uh, but kind of oh, done on like old parchment paper kind of looking yeah, stuff. Trying to go for like a, like a medieval looking medical document or something. right yeah, yeah uh but i think there's actually a term for for that kind of style or that kind of uh imagery uh, but can't I think mean, of it but regardless I mean, it yeah. it was one of those things that i kind of was looking at the thing it, it this record feels like a full album like it was meant to be as it exists songs go the way they do and it just kind of makes me wonder like doesn't it kind of suck like you just said knowing that like you're going to kind of have put forth all this effort and energy into something and someone's just going to be like okay this is it uh fancy win you know like they're yeah. going to they're like three or four songs they like put them on a playlist of their own and then that's it and the rest of the what you've spent your time on yeah kind of well, goes by the wayside yes and no cuz i don't really care i mean if people are listening they can listen however they want for one that's a thing but i mean i think for us like myself at least and alex and probably the rest of the band like we all have a soft spot for albums too like like albums you know i like still listen to a vinyl here and there or if i put on an album listen to the whole thing yeah and a lot of people now don't focus on the album as a, a whole i guess um but a lot of people still do and there's still people who get the cd and people you know they have it in their changer in their car or there's people <laughs> uh, who like vinyl collecting and stuff and I think, you know, even if that's like the vast minority of listeners, it's still still cool for them to be able to have that experience. And and just for us, it's like something that we feel like would be kind of shot if we weren't doing like it would be like, oh, yeah, well, no one's going to do this. And so fuck it. You know, that's not like how we operate. So um, if that makes sense. I, I mean, I'm not too worried about it. I think like, you know, we have a lot of like kind of core super fan types i feel like they're probably gonna listen to the whole album and then people who just find out about us through like you know however they find out about us if they want to like check out some singles by all means you know i mean but if they want to check out the album too i don't want that to be like a weak point like oh this doesn't even sound like an album whereas if you know if they do listen and they notice like this is cool it's like a whole album then then good i mean that's basically my thoughts. Yeah, I know. It, it just, I just gets... like, why am I wasting my fucking time? This is all such a pain in the ass. Like, Jesus <laughs> Christ, how long have I been working on this? No one gives a fuck. But, like, the other part of me is like, well, you got to do it because someone cares, you know? <laughs> well, it almost goes to the, the point of, like, you know, I look at a lot of, you know, independent bands, actually, and it seems like they borrow a lot from pop and hip hop, where it almost seems to be, it's not necessarily an album. It is the single. The single is kind of, we're reverting back to, like, how, the music industry was back in like the fifties and so forth where yeah, it's ordered around. Yep. AOR, right. So, and then all of a sudden now, instead of it just being the seven inch or whatever you're buying and then a tour, it's like, well, here's the, you know, we're going to use fancy or like, this is it. Like, here's the, this is it line. Like here's all the merch for it. Here's the, the single, the seven inch, whatever. And then, yeah. you know, maybe fancy wind is your, your spring collection or whatever. And everything's built around, your brand essentially not just your band and your music it, it's all encompassing which is kind of interesting and kind of weird to kind of yeah uh, look I at it that way it's interesting in a sense too because like songs i mean there was popular songs like back in maybe the 1800s there'd be like a piano in every house and someone can play it and that's that was songs and then there's wax cylinders and people are like oh what could we do with this and then by the time like recording technology came around and like, I guess the twenties and thirties when it started to become more of a thing, it was just songs at that point. And then when, I guess when FM radio came out, that's when people started playing whole albums on, on air, uninterrupted, which sounds like awesome. Um, wish I were there for that. But um, then people start getting really into like how their album would flow and all that. And, and that kind of dominated up until, yeah really when streaming took off again now it's like we're kind of back to where we started where it's just a song um so it's interesting to think that the albums really kind of weren't even an art form until basically the late 60s you know i almost wonder if it was <laughs> just so the djs could do their drums oh probably <laughs> huh yeah okay we got a long one yeah for sure uh, might be just be uh my ozark watching in the last uh 
six hours where I'm plowing through the new season. Oh, how is it? I still have yet to, I need to watch that. It's a, uh, so the TV I'm watching it on, like I'm in a room very much like this one, but it's like up two more stairs. Um, and it's, I for, always forget how dark the show is. Like just visually, it's very dark. Oh, like so dark. you're not, yeah. So it's like, if you're not watching it at nighttime and even that, oh, I feel like is almost worse, but it's like you get like a glare from uh, a window or whatever. And you're like, what's going on? Am I missing something in that little yeah. section of the TV? Like, it's like, I appreciate your artistic vision and stuff, but come on. <laughs> Really. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's range. you know sometimes it's like you can tell the person who makes the movies like really into the extreme dynamic range and it's like you're watching on a laptop or something it's like i can't hear it or even if you're watching it at night like on your actual system and then you know it's like <laughs> it's like come on like i love dynamic range who doesn't but they got to put a limiter or something they need anyways. Yeah, no, I had that with uh, what the f oh Cobra Kai. I was finishing that up uh, this past week, and it would be dialogue would be real quiet, and then all of a sudden, like during any of the scoring, it just be <laughs> and you're like, yeah. there is no Dude. middle ground. Like I'm either blowing my eardrums out or I can't hear shit. Yeah, and it's like so okay, so they they're forcing you to turn it up to hear the dialogue, and then they, they know you're gonna get blasted. It reminds me of like you know like the mid late '90s movies, and it's like rewatching those, even like Tommy Boy, like any sort of like teen movie from then those are all like 90 percent like music it's really weird like they don't do that like not score but like pop mixes you know like well i'll do you one bunch of songs and that i'll was do like, you one better like, that's that's missing from that era for bands and for movies is i feel like the sync opportunities like where what's the last great what soundtrack what's the last great soundtrack you heard it was also connected yeah i don't even like, and I feel like at least back in my day, like you and granted, like the movie wasn't the greatest, but it's like you look at Queen of the Track. That was a great soundtrack. Uh, sorry you cut out there. Queen of the Damned. Oh, I never saw it. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm shot. <laughs> and then uh, another great one was the like Dracula 2000, where you had like System of a Down doing Metro. Right. Um, like a lot of great cover songs and stuff like that. And was, I just feel like that avenue is gone. A lot more. Now it's like everyone's got their own camp. And, you know, I, I feel like that's a good thing overall but yeah when when like four dudes owned everything there was a lot more crossing over of the various mediums i feel like well i mean kind of speaking to that and you, you mentioned him a little bit ago you know brandon i feel like is kind of that for you in a lot of capacities where you know he came on uh, shit what back in like 2010 something like that 2012 we had a yeah. video out with him yeah but I was going to say, like, you know, having someone who you've been able to work with consistently and build a rapport with and kind of has become an extension of the band in the visual medium. Like, I mean, how has that been to kind of work with someone to help you achieve what you visually want to achieve with the band? I mean, it's sweet. It's definitely like. Uh, I don't know. I've never tried the alternative. You know, I mean, the first five or six years we were a band, there was no goblin or anything no videos we were just dudes having fun um and once we started that in 2012 it was like oh that video sort of went viral you know not not by like today's standards but it was viral <laughs> i think at the time as much as something like that could be um and that sort of changed the outlook like oh now we gotta do all this stuff we got <laughs> we got <laughs> the world and like we gotta do another video and I mean, it's really cool. It's, it's fun to, to do. You know, we started right now, I think, like, I don't even, 2015, like, a while ago. And it was just no one really cared. And I feel like it's kind of a, a real slow burn, you know. But it's, uh, it's I wouldn't say it's work. I say it's working. But uh, it's it hasn't been, like, it wasn't just, like, we wrote it down and we're, like, okay, activate plan. You know, it's been sort of an organic, uh, sort of an organic, uh, just as time goes by, we're, like, what if we try this? And throw shit at the wall, see what sticks, you know? Um, I mean, it's fun. I like having someone there to handle the visual component a lot of the time. And, you know, for Necro Goblicon, it sort of brings it all into this universe. And there's people who couldn't care less about the band who love the Goblin. Some people really like the music and they're like, how come other people don't like this music as much as me? And there's all these various legs, you know? So I'm just happy that, you know, we're doing something.
Well, I feel like, you know, it's interesting is, you know, even looking at your latest video for This Is It, you know, thinking back to uh, some of the first videos you guys are doing, it, I mean, you can't not make the, the analogies kind of or the, uh, the crossover comparisons to like horror films and stuff like that. Right. And I feel like it's so interesting to like, look at, I almost compare it to like the band in the videos almost to like Sam Raimi, like evil dead kind of shit is where you started. And then, you know, and now he's like, I would say where you're at now by comparison is almost like doing Spider-Man where you're like, right. now you're in charge of something you have great looking visuals. You know what the fuck you're doing, but you had to start somewhere. Yeah. And for those that kind of were along for the journey, it's just, it's, it's fun to see the evolution sonically, visually, everything. And I, I wish more people would kind of pay attention to that because that doesn't happen by accident. Like that happens because you have a good team and you, see something for yourself and you try to get yourself there over time reinvesting yeah. in yourself basically right it's interesting you know the way people approach music and even anyone like myself i'll listen i mean it depends but like this last album i mean i was working on it pretty much pretty much non-stop for like three and a half years or something and you know it turns out oh it's like 50 minutes or however long it is and it's like you listen to it and it's consumed and it's like but that doesn't it's not a fair representation of like the actual time it takes to put into something like that. Um, but on the other hand, I, you know, I have faith that people who are in kind of a similar field will understand better. And, you know, what's the point of, you're just making shit to entertain people at the end of the day, you know? So what? as long as my thing with an album is like, got to make it as perfect as you can, because once it's out, it's there forever. So I don't know. Yeah. It's funny. I've been really, interested in this concept and i don't and i don't know if it has a name for it but just you know i kind of realized a while ago that we as fans or music appreciators usually about two to three years behind you as the creators because when you release something like you said it, it's it's now ours it's it's the public's to consume right but then the things that start happening to you once you're done with that that's what's informing the next thing. So we're yeah. perpetually catching up to you, but you have to live in this, this weird cycle of the past and your present while also sort of looking at your future. You're kind of just traversing between all of them at once. And it's very weird. It's interesting, right? Yeah. There's certainly that aspect of like, uh, you know, I've been listening to this shit for three years or something, working on it, adjusting it, recording like I'll do a whole demo. Like, so I'll write and that'll take me anywhere from like two weeks to over a year, depending on the song and like how dedicated I am. Also, like sometimes you just get inspiration, you know, and there are times you have to really bash at it to, to get something how you want it. Um, but where were we? It's kind of interesting in that sense uh, that, yeah, it's like, for me, it's already old, you know, right. like, and um, in terms of, yeah, there's always like, oh, their old stuff was better argument and stuff. And I think our new stuff is better. So I'm not worried about that. But um, there's the whole thing where it's like, well, if you're the dude in the band, like, at least most of us don't want to be just there rehashing the same fucking idea over and over forever. Because it's like, we have lives, you know, and it's like, that'll drive you nuts. And you'll be bored with your life. And I I hope people understand that. Um, but in terms of, yeah, like I'd say, you know, there's at least one or two songs because it sounds like you've heard the whole record. Um, mm -hmm. At least one or two on there, which I try and like, you know, harken back to stench a little bit. Um, give it like a more old school sound just so, you know, for those guys, because there's not that many people who were like, that, that's my favorite album still. But, you know, give them a little something. I don't want to just abandon them. But at the same time, I kind of do so. Um, <laughs> you know it's just it's it's interesting to to live in the duality of of not being in any state of existence in one spot like you yeah. know and and i saw it incrementally with this this podcast where i'd have someone reach out to me and they would comment or if they're like close friends and they listen they would text me something and i would be like what the fuck are you talking about and they're like oh in this episode you said this and they're commenting on it. And I'm like, uh, 
All right, let me oh, let yeah. me let me try to think like, back like four years to this conversation like, I had, yeah, or else I'm not going to remember. It. Yeah, right. And and so and that was the catalyst for me realizing that that's something that you as as creatives, but more so in the music space, go through where you're you're creating in the now because you're inspired now. But we're not going to hear it for however long, just due to how like. That's why, interestingly enough, today I saw that Kanye uh, is putting out Donda 2 in about a month. Um, and it was one of those things I was texting someone and I was like, I don't know how this dude like is able to just put something out like he just put out a record. And then like now he's putting out another one like does like is the label approving all this or like is he just basically like, fuck it, I don't care. And then like someone's like, well, I think at Kanye's level, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but like it's weird because like there are rules and parameters set in place. Like I know some bands that I've had on, it'll be like, okay, so we're gonna sit on your record for a year because these bands and we want it to do well and we want it to line up with this tour. So like you may have sat on a finished record for over a year. So by the time I hear it now, like you said, three years in, I'm over these songs. I'm writing new shit that you won't hear for another little bit. Because I actually told myself like. I told myself after this record, I'm going to like take a year and just not write any necro. See if I can do a little more side project stuff. Of course I start on another fucking necro. <laughs> it's hard to, to control sometimes, but um, yeah. Um, oh, let me go back to, I forgot. I was like, so, cause the songs will take that long to write and then I'll demo it out. Like I'll write, you know, all the instruments and drums and those get changed by the time we really record sometimes. But, um, so I'll do that and I'll demo out the whole song. So it's like a real song, right? And then by the time that's all done, that usually will take me like a year. And like, granted, I could be faster. Like, I guess the ideal world would just be like, I go there, I write a song in a day, move on to the next thing. But that doesn't leave a lot of room to go back and revise. And it's not how I've worked so far. Um, so at first you do that, you create this whole thing. So you have like your own version of the record, essentially, but it's like demo, you know? Mm-hmm. Then you go and you got to track all the drums and then you go and you do all the stuff again. So it's like, by the time it's actually there, it's like two or three different times of like reapproaching the same song. So at that point you lose all objectivity on it. So if, if you've ever, you know, you can't have perspective. Like by the time I'm done with the record, I'm like, this is just oxygen to me. I don't really understand how it's going to be to someone who's never heard it, you know? Well, that's why I always find the demoing process so interesting. And a lot of those, again, speaking to like antiquated forms of medium, but like the uh, the making up records that would usually come out with an album and to see, uh, you know, the band, you know, pre pro, you know, the demo to the pre pro, how different things change there from pre pro to actually recording. And then it's like, oh, well, I have this new inspiration or, hey, someone happened to be For in sure. town and now we have a guest musician. And now this part completely changed to, to hearing the final version. Like those major bands back then, but like they would just lock out a studio for like months and just live there. So, I mean, that that's like some crazy dream to me, you know, I don't see that ever happening. Again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I feel like musicians now are doing that on Twitch though. Like, and I, like I joked earlier that you're not super app, but app, you know socials and stuff would that be something maybe an avenue that might be fun for you is to kind of maybe as a band create like a twitch thing and just kind of go through either guitar playthroughs or for you like hey man like i'm gonna go through the early versions of this song you know how it sounds but let me show you like how i pieced it together the plugins i used and all that would that be something that would interest you at all yeah i mean we've definitely talked about it you know before and and yeah i think that twitch is yeah it's not a bad idea i guess the Socials for me are like a mixed bag, you know, like I don't really believe in the way they operate. Kind of annoys me that it's just like this, it's it's just a big data harvesting machine and everyone's like, yeah, and then everyone wants followers and everyone wants this. And it's like, uh, not for me. I feel uh, insincere, you know, um, when I do that. But Twitch would be fun. It would be fun to be like, oh, weekly, uh, let's make a song or something. I've definitely thought about that. It's also just a matter of like, I'm, I can be fairly inconsistent as a person. So I'd be like, it'd be kind of hard for me to like, okay, it's Friday. I have to do this, but I, I would love to do it sporadically, you know? It's <laughs> yeah. so maybe a bit of a weird question. Um, but I happened to notice when you were talking with your hands, like I do, you have a, presumably a wedding ring. Um, oh, true. So something I always kind of find interesting is finding balance. 
Um, it seems like, you know, you were saying like you spent three years essentially writing some of the stuff that ended up on this record uh, right. between touring and all that kind of stuff. How do you find balance in your life between work, personal and all that kind of stuff? Because I, I find that to be an interesting talking point now. It's kind of hard. It's been weird with the pandemic, too, because it used to be like touring. I mean, I'm, we'll get back to touring soon enough, but um, we're all just like, OK, I'm on tour. I'm just blasting. And, you know, I get home and I'm just like, Pfft. <laughs> but um i would say like trying to find balance is, is the hard part like i'll go through like work binges really more often like i'll be like i'm working on this like crazy sometimes i'll go down a hole and i'll just be like drinking beer for a week working on something non-stop and then i'll be like god what am i doing my brain's about to corrode you know and i'll just go play playstation i mean we got a peloton i was riding that you know it's like uh I haven't been lately, <laughs> but um, are they as awesome as they seem? Like, I really want one because I like riding bikes, but living in Michigan, like half of the year, I can't ride a bike yeah, outside for sure. <laughs> I, I think it, I really like it. Like, um, it's good just to, you know, what I like about it is that you can do these classes where it's just someone telling you what to do. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's nice. Just having someone be like, just do this. And I don't have to put any more thought into it than that, you know, uh, as opposed to like, you know, someone who's really into working out and stuff. They're like, Oh, I created my whole routine and my plan and this and that. I'm like, yo, I got other stuff going on in my head. I can't <laughs> be arsed with that. I mean, it's, it's like always like a, you think about what if I was that sort of person and then you face the reality of like, but am I? Um, and sometimes you're like, well, getting old. So probably not, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. there's a balance. Like, yeah, I guess just, it depends on when the deadline is, you know, if it's possible just to sit there and work a little bit, that's great. But sometimes if you have an idea and you're like, well, I got to pursue this idea, strike while the iron's hot and I'm feeling this way, you know, because sometimes you can start on something and you'll get stuck. And then you, you try and come back a couple weeks later or whatever. And you're like, I don't even remember the mindset I was in. Um, I mean, it's possible to get around. I've gotten a lot better at like getting beyond writer's block, for instance, like now that I've done it, been around the block a few times, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it is a hard thing. Cause it's like, of course, balance is ideal. Ideally it would be like, okay, four hours in the morning for this. Then I go on a hike and then I make a salad and then I fucking blah, whatever, you know, but honestly, that's just not how it goes a lot of the time. Um, in terms of, yeah, like, I mean, we're at home a lot of the time, my wife and I, and that's most of my life, you know. And then writing when I want to. And when the album's due, I'm thinking about that every day. And, like, right now, I'm, like, not not thinking about the next album. This one's not even out yet, you know. So, But it'll get to a point where, okay, it gradually ramps up. Like, actually, for, for uh, Slimes and Humors, I, I probably started about, like, 40 songs. And before any, there was a point where I had like maybe eight to 10 mainly complete songs. And then all those are scrapped, you know, like there, it was like, there was basically a whole other album that I was thinking was going to be the album before this album. And then I started writing uh, like better songs, or at least that's what Alex and Brett thought, you know, Brett's like our manager. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was like, well, you're on this street now. So I'm like, okay, well, let me just write a new one then. So it kind of just kept going and going and, until we got to, you know, there were still like two or three that didn't even make it, which I thought would have been really cool to have on there. But at a certain point, you just got to be like, that's it. We're just going to, we're going to go with this 10 to 12 and focus in on these. And that's what we got, you know? That's your uh, Japanese version. If I've learned anything about that, that side of yeah. the industry, they Japanese want the bonus track. Right. They, I think that was some sort of like, cause Japan like charged a lot more for records and they were, they like imports were illegal or something. So they had to incentivize or no, maybe imports were cheaper, but Japan charged more. So they had to incentivize the Japanese to buy them with exclusive bonus tracks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah something to that effect. I forget exactly what, as I've, as I've kind of befriended a lot of people in various facets of the industry, 
some of the things you learn about where you're like, oh, like, you know, going again back to like the early 2000s when it's like, here's a CD, here's the deluxe version with a making of DVD, here's, you know, a sampler yeah. thrown into it. It was like, why do I have four different versions of the same CD? But it was like, oh, well, here was the regular one. And then to kind of boost the numbers, you throw in another disc. If it was the DVD that counted as two album sales for one unit. Oh, did it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So there was like little tricks like that you start learning about and you're like, oh, well, that's why like this label was notorious for doing that or this, yeah. the things that people would do. Um, but yeah, again, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's very interesting as you kind of start learning more and more about something that you're packed. I was like, man, a lot of the things that are, are in play are just to kind of like fuck over the, <laughs> to require a shitload out of the artist, not give them their just due. And then basically fuck over the fans that do like them. Essentially, it's all. I mean, it's a business at the end of the day. Yeah, it's interesting too because it's pretty much all derived from like mafia style practices, you know. Which is, I'm like, uh, that's that's creepy. I'm kind of glad. I mean, you read some stories about artists who were like fucked over real bad, and it's just like, damn. And then our times, you get someone complaining, and and I'm like, you're already a fucking millionaire. What are you bitching? <laughs> I mean, so, yeah. Well, I mean, the thing that, like, I, like you know, li and I don't want to get into your logistics, but I mean, logistically speaking, your band seems like one where it'd be like, how the fuck do you budget a tour with as many people as you have? Like, because you need, like, you need the keyboardist instead of, like, having, you know, you could, I guess, do backing tracks for that. Yeah, it's like, or, we, you know, like, we, for a time there in between keyboardists, we did tracks and we just built a big robot out of cardboard and said, Beepus is playing the keys, you know? Um, <laughs> That was fun, but, you know, just like all of us playing together, it's like really part of the, the show, and, and we enjoy that. So, um, But, yeah, you're right. It's a pain in the ass with, like, just low guarantees, relatively speaking. I mean, they've improved over the years, but um, I'd say one of the more recent tours before the pandemic was, like, the first time we broke even. We're like, hell, yeah, we broke even, man. This is kick-ass, you know? And that was, like, a big thing so uh i guess what you have to do is just keep grinding and then eventually you can maybe make some money <laughs> <laughs> uh yes yes you can yeah. um i i think i feel like that's kind of the unfortunate thing sometimes you know one of i i think i've told it a couple of times on this but uh i remember the browning were staying at my house after a show and the then uh guitar player and i went to papa john's to get pizza and he had he worked at Papa John's wherever that he was living, so he had like free points to. Oh, earn nice! Pizza. He had the hookup. Yeah, so he just like redeemed his points, got a free pizza, and then some kid as we were leaving recognized him. I was like, "Oh man, like you know, how do I make it? How do I be like you guys?" And then I was just like. And then I kind of walked away because I was like, "Oh, this is awkward." And then yeah. I was like, "Did you tell him that the van you're literally driving here is your house?" Yeah. and like that you literally had to redeem your points to get a free pizza because you have no money right now because you already advanced your per diem for the day yeah it's 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 gnar man it's funny it's like uh and i don't know what it is like today but definitely that perception you know of like i think even like a kind of like you can't be accused of selling out anymore for one like, <laughs> no are you serious like back in the day i feel like if you were an artist who made it to like music videos you already had like a solid advance like i worked for a composition studio for a while it's like an intern and an assistant or no i was just an assistant there but um those dudes i remember he was telling me like oh yeah i got like a songwriting deal in the early 90s he was like a whatever songwriter honestly um nothing no like charting hits and he got like fifty thousand bucks just to like write them some spec songs and that's how it was for a while so i can see why people are you know who think that but that's not how it is now at least in our world um you know what i'm saying like it used to be like a thing like oh i'm just some dude who writes songs and they're like oh i like this song here's fifty thousand bucks make us 10 songs you know and then there you go yeah there's a guy that uh lives in the city i live in uh that used to be in a band that was signed and then i he was one of those people a label would come to him go hey we uh Got Kelly Clarkson. We're writing for her next record. Uh, we want a pop song, like a big, big, you know, first single kind of a song. Uh, want a ballad and mid-tempo song in between. Uh, Needed in two weeks. 
da 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 and then he you know writes whatever he writes and they're like all right feel that first you know the, that's a, definitely a first single uh we'll give you fifty thousand for it and he's like ah, i think i kind of really want it and they're like all right so we want that in the ballad uh we'll do seventy five thousand. And they'll be like, eh. right. And then they're like, all right, well, we really want that one song, 75 or 80,000. He's like, all right, cool. And exaggerated numbers to a degree, but for sure, you know, then he would tell the story. He's like, yeah, that song they were so hyped on. Uh, I wrote it in like five fucking. That's like, the thing too. Yeah. Like exactly. Like that's super dope. I mean, there's something to be said for that. Like I was, I haven't been doing it lately, but I was trying to work on, you know, music for commercials for a long time. Yeah. And this and that. And like everything that, uh, that took me like five minutes, they loved. And if I spent like 24 hours like programming synths and like rearranging shit, they're like, ah, I don't really, I don't like this. It's, it's, there's something about that. If it can just flow out of your head, it's a lot easier for people to instantly understand. Whereas, you know, if well, I you feel like time crafting it, you probably got to listen to it like 10 times to understand what's even happening. Well, I feel like you can even dumb that down to its lowest form and just go, because you didn't overthink it. Yeah, you didn't, you didn't get in your own way, and you can apply that to so many things in life, but especially Dude, that's music. The, that's the fucking the hardest part. That's the real game, right? You know, just not overthinking. Yeah, I, yeah, I had to go to therapy for that because I overthink real bad. I hear you, man. That's that's tough, man. I I do the same thing. But, I mean, I've been getting a little better at it. It's kind of like if I find myself overthinking something, time to go do something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think the biggest key advice that I got in that situation was just focus on what you can literally control right that in there because right. if you're like i mean at least with music i know you can be like well all right so i want to do this and then i want to do that and then like you're already thinking a million super anxiety going on yeah and then all of a sudden it's like well, what are you doing right now to help you get there do yeah. that first and then just kind of go totally it's all about trying to live in the moment huh i mean i feel like that's i feel like that's when the most sincere honest art is created um yeah. uh, but i mean I've seen plenty of musicians have lived with plenty where, you know, they would just fiddle around with something like whatever. What is that? That was really cool. I like that. And they're like, I don't even know. I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, that's where it's at. I, I hear you. Um, it's very, uh, there's something to it. I always liked uh, working on songs with other people around. <laughs> even if they're not seeing they're like critiquing me or something, you can sort of pick up off their energy, you know, and that was Absolutely. always really helpful for me. But, uh, what has been one of the, the most random sources of inspiration when it struck like that? You're like, fuck, I, I, like what was happening and, and what did you, uh, how did. Shit. That's a good question. I don't know. Um, my favorite one that happens is I'll wake up from a dream. Cause I, I like I'm an active dreamer, you know, I, I'm very intense dreams a lot. They used to all be nightmares, but lately I haven't been getting that many nightmares, so that's pretty cool. Um, but anyways, sometimes in a song I'll just have a, I mean, in a dream I'll just have a song playing like it's a soundtrack or something. Like I had this dream like a month ago. I don't know if I'm going to, I just have a riff, but I was like in the fucking dream watching a show, watching some band sound check. Was, we were late for a tour. It was like an anxiety dream. It was like, fuck, we're late. And I'm like, ah. But then watching the I don't know, some band sound check and they're playing this riff. Like, I don't know. Very like kind of a <laughs> not literally that's from Austin Powers, but it was something in that vein. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and I woke up and I'm like, Oh crap. I got to make a voice memo right there. And it's like, those are my favorite. I don't know about the most random inspiration. I mean, there's been so many like tour jokes, like, I mean, get in the bag. It's not a real song. It's like a joke track, but you know, like, get in the bag, get in the bag. Cause we were just fucking around on tour. Like you get in the bag. It's just a funny thought. So, uh, but really for me, my favorite are usually like wake up in the morning with an idea already there, you know? And that's, that's pretty cool because it's like, didn't, didn't have to work for it, you know, kind of just floated in. Yeah. I think, uh, magic I've... fighter was that way too. It was like that, that fucking seven, eight. <laughs> that was just like an early morning. Like, and then I was like, oh, this has to be the magic spider because I already had the idea for that as a title, like a children's book, like Rainbow Brown and the Magic Spider. Because that's what I was calling Eric. It just seemed funny to me. <laughs> One day I woke up with that weird riff in my head and it was like, okay, this is going to be the magic spider, you know? Yeah. Is that something you would, I don't remember if I asked you this before, is that something that you would like to do? Because in the two times now that we've talked, 
you know, you talk a lot about, I have this idea for something, but I never, I didn't know what it was going to be. I just like the, the concept of like, you know, like you're saying like the, have you thought about doing like, I don't want to say a graphic novel, but maybe more of like a children's book of sorts. <laughs> that could be fun. No, I haven't thought about, I mean, you know, I haven't thought about like seriously. Um, I used to write like a little blog and stuff, but, and it was just like absurd stream of conscious ramblings. That was a lot of fun. I guess I kind of fell off and went into like a depression hole for a few years or something, but I've been thinking lately again about like writing cause it's a pretty fun outlet, you know, and <laughs> can uh, be. <laughs> Or you something. can just start beating yourself up about it. <laughs> or that, you know, but I feel like that's already pretty much taken care of. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Having written for uh, an online publication about doing show reviews and a couple of features, uh, I would write notes down, especially at shows. And I remember someone at Rob Zombie, uh, I was like jotting notes down and like visuals and things I was catching because I was like, I'm not going to remember this when I'm trying to think back. And so old man was just like, it's a problem with you young kids. You're just always on your fucking phone. Like, why don't you like look at the fucking show that you paid money for? Right. And then, like, I didn't know who he was talking to because I was literally looking at the show like uh, and was looking around at something. And then I was like, are you talking to me? And he goes, yeah. I was like, I'm here to review the show. I'm writing notes down. Dude. And I turned <laughs> my phone around. I had like paragraphs worth of shit. And then he was like, oh, and I was like, and I'm also constructing it. So it kind of fits like the flow of the evening. Like, yeah. And then I was like, I'm watching. Definitely. I'm watching. But I'm also jotting notes down. But it was yeah. just so funny to like have someone like an old person call me out yeah, for it. I was me. like, I'm working, dude. <laughs> That's true. At least you had a good comeback. I, that, I've been annoyed at times watching someone just looking at their phone filming the show. It's like you're here right now, man. Yeah. But but not oh. if you're on the job. I yeah. That makes sense, you know? Yeah. My favorite is uh, taking videos, and then if I like someone's got the shot I'm trying to get with my phone, I'll zoom in on mine onto their phone <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah. zoom back out a little bit so you can see the performance and the phone. Just, yeah. I don't know, because I I realize the, uh, the stupidity thing, but I'm also like, this is kind of funny, like, inceptioning it. Like, it's this guy's meta, got the better right? shot. It's some meta action, yeah. Well, I mean, when you're almost 40 going to metal shows and shit, I mean, it kind of gets you kind of feel out of place as it is. Yeah. I'm sure when you're when you're almost 40 playing metal shows, it's kind of the same. Right? <laughs> well, I mean, does it? I don't know. Like, it, it's so weird. Like, I mean, you guys played like one of the last warp tours. And I remember uh, coincidentally not knowing about it because we went to uh, Rhode Island to go see a friend's band play their last show. And then found out that warp tour was the next day in Connecticut. So we rented a car and drove through to get to connecticut and uh it was, was just was weird that? what was that what in hartford or something where was yeah that? yeah it was hartford connecticut is it like kind of like yeah a, yeah kind of like a park. uh yeah um, yeah. it was way nicer than going to Detroit, which is in a fucking parking lot and you sweat your balls off. Like for my sure. wife and I had commented how much nicer it was being somewhere else for a warp tour than in the Midwest. Yeah. That's like cool. there's trees a plenty, uh, and everyone just seemed to be a lot more jovial. I never went to one really growing up, but I mean, in the Bay area, it was basically parking lots, yeah. <laughs> but I was going to say, it, it seemed like, you know, between it was almost like the perfect storm of like, Old people like myself, you know, with bands like Acacia Strain, you had Silverstein, you had a lot of bands for people yeah. of our age. And then there was kind of you guys who are older, but are newer, younger crowd, it seems. You know, the the fans of, and I don't want to, you know, say it like this, but it's like the people who, you know, got into extreme metal through things like Death Clock or, you know, Metal right. and things like that, who like a little bit more humor with their... Uh, with mm -hmm. their music and so forth like it was really weird i in listening to the new record i had this really weird thought where i go you guys are like the metal version of foxy Shaz foxy shazam oh yeah and i was like i know that may not appeal to a lot of people but i love the fact that like foxy <laughs> is just who they are unapologetically they have fucking fun and you have fun at their shows whether you like them know them or anything like that and you guys very much encapsulate that same vibe that's the goal i think thank you by the way I, it's just a matter of you know, there's pretentious bands and we have enough, you know, we want to be having a good time for us too. It's not, I mean, it's great to, to have fun and we've never taken things seriously. We're called Necro Goblicon. Like <laughs> if you came for that, you're, you didn't come to the right show, you know, <laughs> we're going to be having some fun. Um, and yeah, I mean, honestly, like we're all friends in the band. We've been through many different lineups. We haven't always 
been all friends all the time but this current lineup we just have a good time like 90 percent of the time we're, we're all laughing you know and i i can say that like if it weren't that way i'm not sure i'd want to be doing it still you know i think that's the 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 realest part of of it now you know like i was just uh an episode we just posted recently with michael from volumes you know he had posted a tweet about if the industry shuts down again a lot of bands and more importantly he said brands will probably fall by the wayside and he goes so what are you doing to ensure that that doesn't happen and we kind of got to talking about people having you know pivoting in the industry and finding their way in other industries by utilizing what they've learned in the music in the music uh oh your mic cut out You've got a little mute picture next to your name. Try that again. There you go. So you are right. something about pivoting. Yeah. So basically pivoting and utilizing what you've learned in the music industry and applying it to this other thing. Like a friend of mine, uh, the band for the fallen dreams, and they were kind of had their heyday in the mid two thousands. And now yeah. everyone's got families and so forth. And now he's in real estate. But what he's been doing is almost doing what bands do for the premiere of a video. Like here's the 30 second teaser here's kind of like hey come back on this day oh, you'll yeah. with houses and you're like i recognize him doing that and where it came from but right. in real estate industry people are probably like i've never seen this before no it's new but it's not and so to me like i feel like that's the thing that i find interesting that i think a lot of people are finding ways to be creative and finding ways to use what they've learned in the industry and applying it to other things like you know i don't I didn't understand what you said you did before, you know, Necro, but I feel like you probably have applied some of those things to the band and maybe vice versa. If you're doing work outside of music industry, you probably applied what you've learned in your time of touring and all that too. Yeah. I mean, it's just like a thing you do with your life. You know, they're all connected. Um, in terms of like audio stuff, mixing and there, there's so many parallels to that and life. You know, you're like, you don't want to overcook it. You just want to remove a little bit of crud you want. And, you know, you could go on. Um, I could go on that is, but it, it's, it's all parallels. I mean, at the end of the day, everything that we approach is all parallel to itself. I think in that sort of acid way, really everything is everything. And if you can see those connections, then you might as well take advantage of that. You know, is that that's kind of the second uh, illusion you've kind of made to psychedelics and stuff like that. Is that something that I'm not going to say, like ask you to like, tell me like what you've done, but is that something you've done? And do you think it's unlocked a lot of, of that connectivity you live in that you've noticed? Yeah. I don't do so many psychedelics anymore, but I definitely had like a big phase back in the day, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, look at these modern fuckers all microdosing. These high-powered tech people are all fucking dosing themselves. I mean, they got. I mean, I don't do any of that stuff. I, maybe once in a blue moon, I'll have like a trip of some sort nowadays. But um, I certainly remember being younger and and tripping and being like, "Oh my god, everything is just fucking connected and so obvious in this state." And then you know, you go back to normal and you're like, oh, it's hard to remember what I was thinking like. And, but it's certainly something that I think was, you know, as a tool is, I mean, it's like been there for millennia and it's part of the human experience. It's interesting how that sort of integrates with like laws and modern society, mm -hmm. but it's definitely, you know, I guess spiritual is like the only word to really use. Um, and having that introspective and, you know, feeling like, oh, there's obviously some sort of fucking energy or something beyond this or blah, blah, blah. Even if there's not, even if we're just fucking crazy for a second. I mean, what does that mean? What is crazy, right? Everything we see and observe is just our brain compiling information into a way that it thinks will help us stay alive, you know? Yeah, in, in the few experiences I've had with them, and I haven't done any in probably like 10 years or so, but it's one of those where I... Like, I almost feel like for me and a lot of people I've talked to that have done it, especially if you do it kind of in your mid-20s when you're like looking at 30 and kind of adulthood is kind of on the horizon, 
that it almost kind of makes you realize like shed your bullshit of like i think i know everything yeah and then you just kind of get to the core of you and you realize like man like this thing isn't fucking important this isn't important and like i need to be a better me and like i need to think about like where i need to be and how i need to get there and i think it'd be interesting now as i'm approaching 40 in a couple of years all right let's see what another 10 years worth of like knowledge and experiences and a little bit of therapy what will that reveal when i do some shit now and see like yeah then what does it tell me what does it inform me from there get deep into the framework and be like whoa yeah that there's something i don't do it anymore but there used to be a thing where i'm like i moved into a new apartment or something i'd be like okay i'm gonna like trip and just lie down on the floor and like really get to know this place you know <laughs> well i feel like a I feel like you're getting, like I said, you're getting to know you because I think it just strips you away of all your own insecurities at times and just makes you deal with what you've been putting off. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, provided you don't have some sort of latent schizophrenia, which, you know, it's, it's probably a good thing for most people to experience at least once in their life, you know? Absolutely. I, uh, the eye-openingness. I remember when I was younger, I, the first time I did it, I was maybe 19. It was like some mushrooms or something. And I was just like, oh my God, my parents are just people too, man. Like, I know. I had that revelation in the last uh, two years. I'll actually, I'll say probably five, but in a different capacity now yeah. of my parents being people. But I've had it at different milestones. Like when I turned 24, I was like, my parents had me 24. I'm not fucking ready for a child. I don't know shit. Yeah. But then as I've gotten older, where it's like, you know, I have a relationship with my parents and I'm like, you're people and I have become my own person and we can have disagreements. And I understand that about from me to you. I still don't think that they see that same way in reverse. I don't know if once you're a parent, you can look at your kid as a, and your, your kid. I don't know if you can look at them that way, ob ob objectively, yes. as a person. Okay. I <laughs> I couldn't tell you, but yeah. <laughs> it's be tough because you you uh, brought them up from nothing. So I'm sure that it's always going to be your kid, you know, but I, I don't know. There's a lot of respect between my parents and myself, I think. So it's possible. Yeah. These are the fun, fun parts of getting old is that you're just like, yeah. all right, what does it all mean? Let's break it down. No, I'm like, if I was my <laughs> dad, right now, I've had a kid for like five, six seven years already i'd have like a seven-year-old and i'm like bro i'm not ready for that shit but you know <laughs> like yeah. i feel like that's the other thing too is i feel like we're seeing a lot of people you know like i said i'm almost 40 where it's like my wife and i don't want kids yeah and there are a lot of people we who are like have the debate we're, we're always like fluctuating like Ooh, do we don't we? you know well i mean like you know we decided to do this trip on a whim and there's a lot of things like that that we do like you know, and to me, it's like I've always said, I'm selfish. I would rather have experiences like I don't have the paternal instinct in me uh, to do anything like that. And I was like, and if you do, that's fine. But, you know, I've always uh, applauded a friend of mine who was like, you know, I use you as the example for people who talk about all the things they want to do in their life and they don't fucking do it. And he goes, I was like, oh, here's my best friend and him and his wife. They don't have kids because they say they don't want them and they want to go do stuff. And they literally do like he goes on a Wednesday. They might go to some different city and go see a show or they might go do this or plan a trip randomly or go do something like they make their life as full as they can with experiences because they're not tied to a child. Yeah, I think that, too, in the past, you know, when maybe when our parents were our age, kind of it was just like what you did. It, it, yeah, it wasn't something you question nowadays i mean a like look at our fucking world right now and do you really want to bring someone into that um and also it's like uh it's out there it's not a thing anymore that like you're a freak if you don't have kids you know which is how it used to be you know? it's more so yeah i also like to make people feel awkward when they go oh you guys are married when are you gonna have kids and i'm like oh you know i'm impotent so thanks oh nice that's a good way to deal with it yeah just uh, like, i just make them feel real awkward oh yeah you know? I, I, I don't know. I feel like that's the thing now is like there's so many weird societal things that in, in just everyday conversations to get to know someone like it's the R-S-T-L-N-E of Wheel of Fortune at the end. Like these are the common words we're going to give them to you for free. And then you figure out the puzzle from there. Like right. those are the certain questions that someone will ask you. Oh, are you married? Yes. Do you have kids? Ugh. And then it's yeah. like, well, now we're already getting into really personal questions. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. Instant. This is like, I guess, you know, it's like shaking hands and then people smell their hand afterwards or something, according to some documentary thing I was watching. <laughs> like, so they did like a study and like 
they were filming, you know, for one of those studies and they would shake the hand and like 90% of the time, the person would be like afterwards, just really? like an automatic reaction that people have. And, and people are like, still, what does that mean? Are you picking up on pheromones or like how much can you tell about someone just from their smell that we're not consciously aware of, you know, stuff. So it's kind of like, I think that equivalent to those sort of questions. <laughs> huh. I I've never heard, or I don't think I've ever seen anyone do that. Yeah. I would, I would hardcore judge someone if I just like shook their hand there and just like, I'm like, yeah, what, what maybe doing? it's just like it happens subconsciously, like Google, like handshake sniff and you'll, you'll see. Are you mainlining my essence right now? Like, what are you doing? Give me some. Yeah, like, <laughs> well, I like you. <laughs> <laughs> very, very weird. That's I, I'll have to look for that for sure. That is uh, humans and animals in general are weird. I mean, we're not sniffing each other's asses so much at least. So. Yeah. No, we're life. just, we got our heads up there. Yeah. We got them up there. Yeah. Um, kind of in, in wrapping up a little bit. Um, this is kind of a weird question, but I was thinking about it actually yesterday on the flight, watching the latest uh, right now thing. Mm -hmm. How long are you guys actually there? Cause I assume these are filmed all kind of at once since they're kind of smaller or yes. within a, a day or so, but like, how long are you actually there? Cause it seems like, cause you're in the background, you have to be there for oh, those yeah. shots. Everything you're assuming is correct. I'll okay. Yeah. Uh, oh. We were there watching him film all those basically and it was like you know 10 hour 12 hour day because we also shot the music right now video yeah the, the promo video and um yeah we were watching all that and um then we come in get various reactions and stuff and there's a lot of uh improv stuff and uh I mean, we were there, yeah, 10, 12 hours. We were all, we probably honestly didn't have to be there that long. <laughs> but we kind of got there early because it was like, oh, there's a call sheet and everything. It's like, okay, I guess we get there at like 8 a.m. or something early, like 10 a.m. I don't know, early for me. Um, but then we end up not doing anything for like four to six hours. And it's like, well, I guess we didn't have to be here, but we're already here. So might as well just sit around, you know. It was actually watching, uh, I think the Tosin one that made me think of it because there was a shot. And then you can kind of see you guys just in the background enough where I was like, are they, but and I, just as I was thinking, like, are, is uh, it really I, them or just stand like something standing like, you know, dummies or a mannequin standing in to get the shot. Yeah, and then I think, and then I think you moved and I was like, Oh no, they're there. I was like, that sucks. <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. Yeah. That's funny. Um, yeah. We were there watching them sitting around. Is and your mic wait. on the whole time or just when you're doing your reactions? Just, just then. Yeah. I'm okay. not mic'd up the whole time. Okay. I'd like to, it'd be fun to kind of do it more like that in the future, like actually interacting with people, but that, you know, it's not exactly how we've done it this time. Um, I mean, cause you know, you've got the goblin, he's doing his thing and you know, they're trying to shoot this thing, get it. They shoot it and then they edit it. And I feel like if there was like random interjections from a bunch of people, it would make it a lot harder. <laughs> well definitely when your interjections happens makes them funny like i think it was the dylan francis one where you were like no but then it had like the reverb on it so to me that made it funnier because i was like right. even in this situation you have this reverb that's not necessary <laughs> right yeah <laughs> but it I makes it we're like standing up on the stage like we're the band you know it's, i don't know and we were actually in the big warehouse too so maybe it's just real oh yeah that's true yeah, I was going to start this off and be like, I'm I'm impressed that uh, you're able to make this interview, you know, in light of the accident, you the tragedy that befell you literally and in, pun intended. Uh, <laughs> and that this is now video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it turned out I was just severely concussed. So hmm. nothing really changed there. <laughs> no, yeah, it'd be good if if that was it. Like, that'd be a great way to just kind of like the band is over, you know, just like we disappear from all social media and life. Um, what well, I mean, I feel like that's the one thing that I enjoy about your band and why I was looking for you back on. So I mean, like, you know, I've had Michael from Guar on and yeah. thankfully he did the he did the chat as as himself, uh, not as a character. But I feel like sometimes with some of these like, you know, a band like yourself or like Guar, where there's the theatrics and, and kind of, you know, more than just the music that it creates kind of this hard thing where it's like, you know, you could come in a hundred percent and just be like, okay, like I'm very serious. This is the character I have, so on and so forth and be committed to that 
a hundred percent, even in the interviews. But to me, I think it's, it's more refreshing that you're not that yeah. all the time, because then it's like, there has to be a reprieve at some point. Cause it's it just, right. it doesn't make this fun. I don't think. I I'm, I'm uh, in agreement with you. I think that that's, that's John Goblicon's job. You know, I'm just here to, the way it was in the beginning, which, which I always found really funny. is like, we're just a regular band. Right. And there's this goblin, like, you know, so it's kind of this dichotomy or something in the very beginning. Uh, it was like, we should all dress as goblins. Not me. Someone else. <laughs> and I'm just like, no, dude, like, no, I'm sorry. Like, I know that's what people are expecting. And it might be weird for us just to have a goblin. But I think it's funny if we're just kind of like this regular band and then we have a goblin. So it sort of has uh, culminated into that being like actually my life now. So that's strange to think about. Yeah, I think when we had talked last, I was like, so how far, how far can you take john and what can you do with him because yeah. at the time all it was is just the music videos and such so at that point john didn't really exist other than in the live setting it was almost i think i referred to him as your interpretive dancer a la the prodigy yeah. uh but i was like outside of that like where what can you do with this does it become your eddie like you know your 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 oh. mascot and so forth so it's funny to all these years later to see like i said there's a book there's like all these things and it's just wild to have seen kind of the evolution of that even. And just, I mean, the motherfucker has cameo. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, pretty wild. It's funny. I think, you know, sky's the limit on that. Uh, we'll take it as far as we can. You know? <laughs> Do you also get a cut of that Chili's, <laughs> Chili's deal? Oh, no. I mean, I think they sent us a gift card once. It's sort of funny. It's like basically like unsolicited advertising on our part just for a joke. Um, Essentially, I don't I don't know if there's if Dermer has like a game plan with that, but uh, <laughs> we, got a card. We, we got a suit. I mean, you know, you know what? I think that's that's your next evolution as a band. You have to play in a Chili's. I really think you're right. Yeah, I'd love I mean, to play in Chili's. I still see that. Uh, what the fuck but is it up? It has Denny's? to be like on a Sunday brunt. Like yeah, there has to be families there who don't know we're going to be playing. That's part of the deal. You know, oh, my. He could be like the scarier version. I don't know if he can get much scarier. The scarier version of the uh, uh, what the fuck, Chuck E. Cheese band. Just a curtain reveals, and then there you are. <laughs> We're all animatronic. Yeah, that'd be sweet. I'd send out an animatronic version of myself on tour if I could. Yeah. Uh, what what was that? Yeah. I was like, what was? I mean, shit. Kiss is basically doing it now. <laughs> I mean, all those legacy bands. It's like you. They're just puppets of themselves anyways no i mean i think that's god that's that's a more interesting talking point to me you see a lot of these legacy bands yeah. and most of them like i think uh i think it's foreigner i think they have one original member he can barely play he comes out maybe for one song but 99 percent of the rest of the set is hired guns basically it's interesting thinking about it in that way it was sort of funny too like for instance we toured with limp Bizkit. Uh, for this Kerrang thing back in the day, and yeah, and like they were sweet and everything, but like half their set was uh, covers. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And then Fred Durst also had—I don't know if I'm allowed to say it. Probably I didn't sign an NDA. He, he had like a teleprompter where in between his monitors, so he wouldn't forget his lyrics and stuff. Or, or and they were doing so many covers. But then it struck me like we're basically watching them do karaoke because he's like reading these cover lyrics off a of screen. And then like they were still all like the real dudes except for the DJ, you know. And so yeah. it wasn't I mean, if they're playing 30 years from now, maybe. But I just thought it was really interesting that like you're you're watching these dudes play karaoke, you know, basically. And uh, if, if you're all just like. I mean, it'd be really funny to have a Necrogoblicon comprised entirely of like different members, you know. Uh, well, you could always do, do like a Trans Siberian Orchestra to have a A touring and a B touring hit like your A markets or a coast it, and coast. It was a lot like uh, 10, 50, a long time ago. It was like uh, my old bandmate and I were like, we wanted to make like multiple versions of Necrogoblicon and have them all tour at once and stuff. <laughs> like, oh, we're part of Necrogoblicon West, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> gang affiliated necrogoblicon it out yeah yeah i mean i like i said i don't feel like we're too far removed from that i think uh Common, man. <laughs> the guys in, i think the guys in kiss pretty much have said that like with the makeup and shit like that people just want to hear the music and that's all that matters at the end of the day totally it's very weird yeah. um 
But I mean, that's what shows are, if you think about it, from like a traditional like theater perspective. I'm sure, you have your original Broadway cast, but the show continues through so many iterations. So in that sense, it wouldn't be weird. But it, from what we're used to in music, it would be weird. So, yeah. I mean, when I went to go see, uh, speaking of Kanye again, we uh, wife and I went to the Donda thing in Chicago. And the biggest takeaway for me going to something like that, having been to all kinds of genres of music and festivals and all that stuff was what does the the ramifications of presenting an album that is not out in a live capacity what does that what is the ripple effect of that moving forward will you start to see bands and artists performing songs that aren't out will never be released and just kind of see how things react live in a room and kind of invite you to experience the creation of of a, a living record essentially i feel that was more in the past like for, I don't think you'll see us doing that because there's too much. It's a, our songs are so you know complex. It's not like put down the beat and we can perform it. It's like we a lot of rehearsal and everything. But back before it was just like you know we'll have a click track now and we have like extra keyboard sounds and samples and not we're all playing our shit you know. But there's you've created there's a, a lot, show. There's so many layers of the keys that you, you'd need like five keyboardists if there were no tracks. Um, but back in the day when it was just like raw, like Goblin Island, like way back in the day, I mean, we would play shit out that we hadn't recorded yet. And that, that was fun. But I mean, it's it's such a different experience live. And, you know, honestly, Kanye, that's he's just like making power moves all the time. So I can see it from that perspective. But also for, for someone like us, I think people are really, you know, excited to to hear stuff that they're already familiar with. I know for me, if I'm at a show and I don't know any of the songs, I'm just like, what is happening sometimes, you know? Yeah. I think that was the interesting thing. You know, there have been, I got one more, like I saw blind guard. Now I'm a huge blind guardian fan, but when I (laughs) I just like got into him, I I barely knew anything except for the album fly. I guess I got him around Oh seven or something. And they came to San Francisco and they were just playing their classics and the whole fucking crowd was singing along. And I didn't know any of these songs. And now I look back and I'm like, damn, if that was like such an amazing show, but I didn't even know it. Cause I was like, what is happening? You know? I had that happen with Meshuggah. I saw him open for tool on the ladder Alice tour. Yeah. And I remember looking over at my dad going, this is the worst shit I've ever fucking heard in my life. This is garbage. <laughs> and now thankfully, at least I can remember it. And I go, Oh my God, I saw him on the, like the chaos fear album cycle. Yeah. And like, I, now I look back and I'm like, Oh, and he was like christ this is so fucking cool i know like like, only i appreciated it more like same thing happened to me i was like 13 or 14 i saw system of a down at like some not so silent night it was a big live show for the bay area and uh yeah i wasn't really into him yet but uh, now i'm like damn if i could see them and appreciate them like i do now you know but we're gonna go see him soon but it's like at an arena it's totally different Two, two, two fold uh, on that. These will be my last two questions for you. So I'll tell you a story and then I'll ask you a question. So I went to Sonic Temple as media and no one seemed to know where our media area was to go to. So I'm walking on the, uh, like the arena floor or actually it's the stadium floor. And someone's like, Oh, just go to that, that tunnel and it'll be there. All right. So I walk in, show someone my pass. I have my backpack full of all my shit. Like, yeah, just go on right through here. And it's right over there. I walk in the first, like I'm walking with my wife and I'm looking around. I'm like, I don't think we're supposed to be back here. And then like the door they pointed me to was system of a downs door. And I'm just (laughs) kind of like standing in front of it. And I'm like looking around, trying to see if there's any like information to like where anything is. So I was like, if I'm backstage, there's gotta be something pointing me to media. Right, like, and so yeah. I'm looking, and then someone's like, "Can I help you? You look lost." I'm like, "I'm looking for media," and someone pointed me here, and I'm pretty sure System of a Down's dressing room is not my media area. <laughs> and they're like, "No," and they're like, "Yeah, you got to go this way." Um, That's fine. So yeah, so I was waiting for someone to possibly pop out, but uh, have you gotten any feedback uh, from your system cover at all from any of the guys? The the dudes themselves? No, I think. No, I wish we would. Um, but you know, they're, they're they're probably. I know Serge lives in like New Zealand. Jealous. Sure. Jealous. That's a great place. We went there on vacation. It was the best. I'm like, I would move there if I could. I don't blame you. Um, but um, the uh, I think someone. The, 
friend of a friend was friends with Darren. They said he heard it at least. So I think they've heard it. And, you know, it's a pretty cool cover. I don't know if they're, they're probably like, what the fuck is this? Who's the band? Why is it like a trap song? I don't know. But um, I don't know. I hope they liked it. I hope one day we cross paths and they say we fucking hated it or we liked it. You know, good to know. Would it be better if they said they hated it outright? Like, would that just be better? I don't think so. I would be like, damn. <laughs> I thought you might have liked it, you know. <laughs> Your original thing is so raw and real, and, and then we made like a really overproduced one, which I like. I, I spent like a long time on that that cover because I produced it basically, and it was a big pain in the butt. Like I, <laughs> I've like found like stems of their tracks on YouTube from like the rock band, listening to all the things, trying to make sure I can get it all right. And I got like ninety percent of the way there. Like there's like a tempo change, like every. Mm -hmm. fucking car almost in our version but whereas in their version i think it's just like you know yep actually a human playing and then maybe uh, some loops here and there so it was it was a really fun process to uh to try and like extract all the dna but yeah make it glossier or whatever you want to say i don't know <laughs> shine um, shine I'd, 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 I'd like it'd be cool it'd be super i'd be like you know fan mode if they were like oh we heard it you know but uh, they probably heard it I'd probably listen if someone covered one of our songs. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh, Loudwire will get you to do one of those where you just got to watch all the covers of your own band stuff. Right? Yeah. That's, that's the thing they like to do for content. <laughs> I feel like, you know, like in like 20 years, someone will like do a cover and I'll be like, really? How do you even find us? I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> found you on TikTok. Right? Yeah, TikTok. No way. That's just like pure send all your stuff to China. Yeah. Well, my wife and them have, have I do not. And uh, no, I, I feel very much the same way. And I'm like, what is it? And they're like, hey, you get a, like no like one can that. tell me what it is or what you let do. Me, let like, me get another dances? addiction, please. Hook me up with another addiction. That's what I need. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, cool. Yeah. Let me, I mean, you know, you're going to watch it and then be hooked on it. You know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah. Well, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, it's, it's weird that I'm where you were supposed to be and here, here I am. And I know, you're not. I know. that's crazy. So, uh, but well, you're, I like I said, you're better dressed for it than I am. I know this would have been my main staple out there. Yeah, my dad got me this. He's like, you gotta wear this on stage. So I'm I'm kind of this is my debut of the new frilly rock mount. Uh you gotta come off a top rope macho man style with the frill. Yeah, it's kind of got like a bird vibe. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of opportunity with this shirt. So I'm looking forward to to those shows. Can't wait to see you in a pit with that. That'll be great. <sighs> no, they'll this is I won't go with the commons. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was really fun talking to you. Hopefully uh, some touring will happen soon and you'll end up somewhere where I'm near. Maybe we can do one of these in person and, and or at least share a beer. Or Yes, sir. I'm sure it'll happen here in the next year or two. Um, but, you know, we're just all watching the virus sphere. And yeah. Bands are touring, though. We'll be out there soon. What uh? What would you like to plug? Anything online? Not so much you. We already covered that. But anything online you'd like to plug? Like not Necrogoblicon. Well, I mean, just well, I like I said, I was joking. You don't really have social, so like, oh, me, yeah, than you. Oh, <laughs> what, um, what online would you like to plug? <laughs> you can, oh, actually, if you want, you find it through the Necro page. I just barely post. Um, I might once we're on tour, I'll probably be posting more again. Um, not really. I mean, no. Uh, you know, just follow <laughs> the bands, buy shit. Um, if you like, if you like, really want to talk to me, send a message over Insta. I'll probably look at it. Um, at some point. And then, um, yeah, I don't know. I have nothing to plug outside the band, so. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, Make again. Barbecue and eat it. I like grilling, so, yeah. I have noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day, man. All right. You too, man. Have fun.